All right, I want to welcome everybody tonight to our event um, put on by the Southern Tier Special Education Task Force. And our topic tonight is first and emergency response persons with disabilities. Um, it focuses on students with disabilities and emergency response. We are um, lucky to have a wonderful presenter today by the name of David Whalen. Um, he has been in the field of disability since 1986, founding Disability Awareness Training in 2004. He's presented some 650 times, 250 times in the field of first and emergency response. He is the project director of the Niagara University First and Emergency Responder Disability Awareness Training Program creating the nation's only comprehensive training for law enforcement, firefighters, emergency medical services, and 911 telecommunicators. Dave's background in emergency planning, preparedness, response, and recovery includes chair of the New York State Independent Living Council Emergency Preparedness Committee, a FEMA access um, and functional needs trainer, and he's a presenter at FEMA Get Real and New York State Emergency Management Association or NACEMA conferences. So welcome everybody. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for coming everyone. Appreciate you being here. Uh, as stated, you got my background here at the university. We have developed on top of the first responder training, the emergency management training, which has been incorporated in the uh, factions of the state of New York, not embedded, but incorporated into factions. We were uh, funded by the Development Disabilities Council for both of the grants that you see on the screen here in the logo for format. And uh, from that, uh, we took the programs across the state. The law enforcement program is actually embedded in the New York State basic course for police officers. Every new officer in this state gets the gets the, most of the law enforcement uh, training. I'll speak more to that uh, in a little bit here. Uh, the emergency management content uh, has been uh, well received and Sue Ruff, who's also on this call, uh, was the nice silk New York State Independent Living Council Emergency Preparedness Committee chair after myself, but is also very active in this. So I want to note that you have uh, also a, a person of expertise, a subject matter expert, if you will, in right in your region. And please, please utilize Sue and her services uh, from a regional standpoint. That's what we encourage is to uh, get individuals who are able to uh, address the needs in a, a county or region uh, specifically, knowing the operations, knowing the agencies, uh, county, uh, county municipal employees who include emergency managers, disability organizations and such. Uh, what we're gonna be doing here is uh, in a somewhat of a fast paced manner, uh, go over two different factions, a little bit on a first response in people with disabilities, students and young adults, and emergency management and planning preparedness response and recovery. Um, our intentions when we do our big programs are that people with disabilities are active in the planning process for emergency management, as well as our newest initiative, which is people with disabilities are also active in educating and working with their uh, local first responder departments. I'm the father of a 24 year old young man with uh, uh, several disabilities. Uh, my twins were born 11 weeks premature a while back, 24 years ago. And uh, from that, my son's premature birth, my children's premature birth, my daughter for full disclosure, Rachel does not have a disability. Uh, David has spastic quadriplegia cerebral palsy, he's a power wheelchair user, a learning disability, dysarthria, uh, seizure disorder, uh, and low vision. Uh, and David's doing great, he actually works for us here at the, at the university a day a week. Uh, also joining us is Carrie Newman, the program manager for, our pro, uh, for the uh, operations here. And it, throughout the program, she will be putting valuable tools and information in the chat box. So please download those and uh, print them as best as you can. If you have needs uh, beyond today, I'll have my contact information at the end for you to reach out to us if uh, you missed a document or a form, if you were looking for other uh, information. So bear with my rapid pace. Uh, it's tough for me to trim. We have a lot of programs. The emergency management program, as Sue will attest, is a two full day training. Uh, and we have uh, within our first responder program have developed advocacy training. However, we developed that after our New York State grant. We're currently, and I should state this before I move on, we're currently active in Missouri and South Dakota with our first responder program. 
with our emergency management program, we're active in Missouri, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Louisiana. Uh, with uh, finding out soon if Connecticut will uh, be awarding us a grant. Our topic is based on, on justice and people with disabilities. And this quote, I'll ask you to throw in the chat box if you know who said this quote and where I took this picture. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. It affects one directly, affects all of us indirectly. So the social justice movement is specific that in this case, in many, in many cases to, to law enforcement goes well beyond law enforcement, uh, is front and center with emergency planning and preparedness and response with people with disabilities. It uh, just isn't always talked about in that context. Uh, the number one loss of life with basically every disaster in this country, which was highlighted and brought to the forefront with, with uh, Hurricane Katrina is people with disabilities, infirm elderly, and children. So when we hear those numbers and we hear those, those excuse me, those demographics, uh, we need to be alarmed. And uh, those continue to happen. Uh, Katrina was 17 years ago. Yes, Sue, this is MLK quote from his uh, monument in DC. Uh, we need to be alarmed and we need to be responding to that from an advocacy standpoint. I'll talk about how to do that today. The reason this grant started in New York State, and in essence, this has since carried across the country, uh, we were the pioneers on this program model for both the emergency management and the and the first responder, was at a mother in Leroy, New York. If you're not familiar with Leroy, it's about uh, four, 30 minutes south of Rochester. Uh, my adult children, this is Anne's quote, may not present the first responders in a manner that would be understood. I will avoid calling 911 at all costs. Well, why did and have this fear. She didn't just have a fear because she had two adult children with uh, one with uh, autism and uh, who is deaf and the other with an intellectual disability. Uh, she had an experience that did not go uh, to the, was not catastrophic, but her son with an, with an intellectual disability stuck a pen into his chest. She naturally called 911. Uh, often at, or really at every 911 call, a police officer will show up. It's not the case with EMS or fire. They'll come when they're there to be dispatched. But whatever the call, there will be a police officer on scene. He showed up first at her house. Uh, when he entered the house, her adult son with autism, who was deaf, ran upstairs. The officer chased him. She says her heart skipped two beats. The intent of the call was not for her to explain to an officer uh, her son's uh, characteristics for autism and the fact that he wasn't going to communicate uh, based uh, on his the officer's lack of understanding on how to communicate with someone who's deaf, first call was for their son with a pen in his chest, and it did well. Again, nothing bad happened in the in the interaction with the son with autism and who was deaf. The scenario was not what she had in mind. Going upstairs to deal with the officer when the intent was her son downstairs. What does she do from here? You can imagine the chaos and and how she responded. She is really the pioneer to this. The disability agenda in general, uh, and I show you this for a, a couple of reasons, is it's a much bigger picture. If you caught in the bio there that I've done about 250 trainings for emergency response, I've done about 400 trainings for a bunch of different audiences, from recreation departments to teachers. And, and on Monday, I'll be in Nebraska training county and town clerks at their state association conference, uh, municipalities. Everyone needs disability awareness training to some extent, uh, even us who are well-versed in disability aware awareness. Uh, Sue will attest as someone who's very active in disability to the point of being your uh, disability advocate in, in the uh, Independent Living Center, Southern Tier Independent Center, that we're always learning, we're always reading. Uh, the, the books I am cur currently reading are, are based on education specific to disability. But point being here, this is really when you nutshell our agenda, here it is. Um, and within this, some of these in bold here advocacy, governance, and municipalities are what we're gonna focus on today. So I'm gonna show you a, a brief video here. This happened uh, just south of uh, Syracuse, New York. It's a video that we show our firefighters and EMS. Note all the different points and issues, matters of concern that come to play here. And, and I'll also ask you if you can catch on that, put it in the chat box, what uh, Jamie's disability is. Well, I am standing this opportunity to share my expression of reality of the accident. 
I will show we scared. Sure we scared. Scared in the scared scared in the in the van. I was sure we scared in the van. We hit uh, a car that was parked half off the road and we didn't kind of a blizzard, we really didn't miss it, didn't really see it. And it hit on Jamie's side of the car and uh, kind, of kind of pinned him underneath his legs and uh, his forehead and nose hit the dash. I, uh, driving of course, I broke my arm. And it was all, all in a matter of you know seconds that it happened. And there were two ambulances and they were trying to send Jamie one place and send me another place and everything kind of panics on it. You know, this time Jamie was unable to speak. So as I was desperately telling him that uh, we cannot be separated, uh, we need to go together. And I, I had a hard time getting that message through until I finally told him I refuse treatment. I said, I'm going with my son. I said, I don't care what's the matter, I refuse it. And then you finally caught the, the idea that we could not be separated. It just wouldn't work. They wouldn't be able to get any information out of Jamie at that point or time. And I was more concerned about him. I simply was injured, and it made me frightened. If you cannot speak, it's paramount to stay with your parent. First responders assess the accident, if it happens to be a car accident, quickly and you know make decisions on those bases. But I think they always have to look at the whole picture and have it in the, their mind, especially if there happen to be young children involved, if there's, is there any other medical needs like a nonverbal or special needs trial or any other type of individual like that, including adults. You know, it's just something that they always have to have please, in the back of their mind. Please speak quietly in the effective method. Um, one thing, we were talking, we talked to a couple other um, users of typed communication. <laughs> The, when we knew we were coming here. And we were at the uh, conference a couple of years ago and one of the other speakers went backwards off the stage and when she went back, her leg stayed up on top and remember Jen and she broke her, her leg. leg. And <clears throat> we just found, and Jen's in her 30s, so she's older and has had a little more experience, but what she said was she still thinks, you know, they talk so loudly in your face, and it's almost if you can't um, use your voice to respond, may, perhaps you're deaf, and so they talk louder. <laughs> and she said that was very upsetting to her, so I, I'm pretty sure that's what you're referring to when you say speak. Speak quietly in the effective method. And the other thing Jen suggested, she said, and you talked about too, when you have the sensory issues because you have very acute so, sense, of, sense of smell, sense of smell and, and taste and also your hearing, your hearing? hearing is like hyper acute. So sirens to you are very, very, lo very, very loud, loud and they really really bother you, bug you. Yeah, they really bother Jamie, the sirens. And then you said also when they were going to check your eyes with the light. With the light there? Mm -hmm. They didn't prepare you for that. By the time, then I had come into the emergency room when the two of them were each laying on a separate gurney holding hands with bl blood all over them. And that upset me. And then when he came to look in your eyes with the flashlight, you just had a really hard time with that. Um, but we found out later when you were talking to me and you said, if you prepare me in a calm voice ahead of time saying, Jamie, we're going to put the flashlight in your eye. Um, to, keep, to keep calm. <laughs> I really think it's paramount to keep calm. Particularly, it's your, it's your, it's your life. That's true. So educational intentions are what we want with our first responders. And what we did is develop a lot of videos. I'm showing you some of the content here, content here for a purpose. Uh, part of what we ask you to do is be an ambassador so you understand what's coming to play here. But as, for your intentions here, your students and young adults with disabilities and interactions with first responders. Um, note the varying concerns that, that come forward here. Uh, the separation by the EMTs or paramedics at the time, Jamie was nonverbal. He didn't start verbalizing until he was 14. Um, that's an old. That's the old facilitated communication that goes back for you folks in the DD world back in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and the reason he had that, Mom told me after we she goes, "Did you recognize he was nervous?" I said, "No, he 
I think of nervous as someone um 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 and sweating and turning red. But this is how nervousness presented with him. He brought that to be a support um, because he was going to be nervous in front of the camera. But it didn't display in the same way, in a traditional manner, if you will, um, which is also enlightening. And we educate on that. So how does how does your son or daughter present? Uh, what might be challenging to them? How might they um, uh, sh indicate or indicate might not be the right word, but how do, when they when they present? What might be different or peculiar that would be confusing to a first responder? Um, did you heard the different challenges there with uh, lack of response? He didn't tell Jamie what was happening. Well, why not? Because he had a disability and he wasn't going to understand it, inaccurate. Uh, Jamie's disability, I see people in the chat box here, uh, is autism. And uh, he uh, he's a Syracuse University graduate. So when we're, we're talking about education and intelligence, intellect, Certainly going to understand when someone's talking about putting putting a light in his eye. Um, so the different the different concerns, and then Jamie's point at the end, it's it's about it's about my life, right? So you know, understanding what it means personally now, what could happen in these scenarios? You know, when, when I'm hearing you're going to refuse treatment, yeah, that's not going to work for my son to be to be going with you. And then the, to take it to a, a tragic step here, Robert Ethan Saylor uh, in January uh, 2013 went into a movie theater with his uh, aide from Frederick, Maryland, uh, 26 years old at the time, to see the movie Zero Dark Thirty um, the evening show. But there was a show after that. They walked out in the lobby after the show. Uh, she went to get the car. He stayed in the lobby and decided he wanted to go back in and watch the show. So he walked by the ticket taker who happened to be the manager and went and took a seat in the theater to watch the evening show, uh, the late show. And to the, which, at which point the manager uh, summoned his security guards and who are all three off duty sheriff deputies from Frederick County, Maryland. Uh, and they went in to handle the situation. She went in the aid, uh, got pointed to, the, to where he was when she asked the manager and they wouldn't, the one officer stood outside and wouldn't let her go in to the, the theater. She was in the complex, but she wasn't in the, the theater itself for the movie. Um, she bolted in the doors when she heard Ethan saying, mommy, it hurts, into which a couple minutes later, he lay dead on the floor at a uh, movie theater complex in the uh, upper area of the uh, theater area. This should have never happened. We all know that. Um, officers, when we show them the video, which Carrie will put in the chat box, uh, we have a mini documentary on this. I ask you to watch it. I don't need to expand on this. You'll see the, you'll see the, um, it's on YouTube. Ethan Saylor, never again, if you uh, forget to pull it up here. Uh, but this is why we educate. And education comes from all of us. And training needs to be front and center for all first responders. There's a statistic out there that we were unfortunately lost our reference to, but 50 to 80% of an officer's day is encountering a person with a disability. Uh, EMS numbers, we don't have a statistic, are going to be very high. The, the numbers of people specific to, again, challenges with, with disasters uh, are, are high. So we, we, can, we are, uh, see people with disabilities as being at the high end of these statistics as far as interactions and issues, but we don't see this as a priority oftentimes with, with, the, with the first responder departments and emergency managers. What we basically are talking about in a, in, in, a, in a condensed version tonight, but what our efforts are here are what you see here, law enforcement, fire suppression and fire safety. It's not to say firefighting. Most, most of the time, firefighters are not fighting fires. Um, 911 telecommunications. It starts with the 911 operator or dispatcher. We have a signed agreement from the National Emergency Numbers Association. They came to us and we have a signed memorandum of understanding because they recognize that the dispatch could start this, should be able to start the response up appropriately. Without an educated telecommunicator, we are missing a lot of information that they just don't know how to communicate to the dispatch first responder. That could be the whole key to a proper response. Uh, EMS and everything that goes with medical services to include that uh, pipeline to the healthcare services, to the, to the, to the hospital and what they can do to uh, properly respond there. And then emergency management, which, be, which is a different context in and of itself, but certainly related. As I say, first responders are emergency responders, but all emergency responders are not first responders. 
And 1% of the population are those people who are responding to 99% of the population. Let's also give respect here. My intentions when I talk are not to, to damn these, these individuals, but to, but to applaud them, uh, but to be sure that they're trained and educated in it. Think of volunteer firefighters. We've all probably volunteered. You're probably volunteering somewhere now. Uh, is it a volunteer situation where you're, you're putting your life on the line, where you're getting woken up at two in the morning on a Tuesday, or you're leaving your kid's birthday party to go attend to someone who needs you? So understand that there is good intentions here. I've trained thousands of first responders. 95% of them get what we're talking about. But it also needs to start with those with the sheriffs and the chiefs, fire chiefs, police chiefs, EMS supervisors, 911, uh, what we call public safety answering point or call center supervisors. And we all have a role in that. Our content is based on uh, I train the trainer model, but we also utilize people from the disability community. This is what every first this is what every law enforcement officer in the state of New York gets when they go through our full program. It's about 400 pages and it's condensed, even though it's comprehensive, it's condensed. We can have more. It takes about two days. It should take a week and we could do that if possible. Uh, that calls for time. What do we go up against? Time, money, other training, priorities, and a lack of understanding of the, of the importance of this. We provide proper resources and local resources. So again, uh, having Sue on this call is pivotal because she understands these programs extremely well, as a matter of fact, as well as maybe anyone I work with in the country. Uh, so utilize her in her, in her role uh, at, at the Independent Living Center at STIX, uh, Southern Tier Independent Center. Because uh, we want them to connect with the community resources uh, and other tools and materials that we provide them, handouts and information. I want you to have an idea of, of what the program entails. Uh, videos that are educational, like you saw with the Burks, we've developed a lot of our own videos and we use, we've used subject matter experts with every disability. So what's your concerns here, getting into more of the content of what you're here today? Well, first of all, first and foremost, I, I point to two things when I talk in general to parents, service providers, and first responders, communication barriers and anxiety. Let's talk communication barriers, what we see on the screen here today. So. I'm going to a call and my intention is to verbally communicate with the individual that I am tending to be it a, 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 again, whatever the call may be for law enforcement, fire EMS, they all play out a little differently, or I'm taking a call. My hope is that, and my thought is, and I'm trained to talk to the individual in English and have clear and understanding responses as best as possible. Remember, it's a 911 call, so there could, there's, there's gonna be some heightened anxiety, as I said a minute ago, um, but I'll expand on that a little bit more. It's just more than just a call. And that we can communicate to the point of understanding and how I can tend to your needs if it's a medical emergency or address the situation if I'm victimized or if, I, if there's a belief to be that I'm even a perpetrator, that there's this clear cut communication. Now, the person doesn't speak English. The person uses American Sign Language. The person doesn't doesn't quite doesn't have full receptive language skills, the ability to understand, process, and then reply accordingly. The person is not clear in what they're saying. There's a lack of understanding. Think of people with dementia. We have 30 million Americans in this country with a cognitive disability. So how do you communicate? How does your child communicate? What are those modes of communication? A picture exchange communication uh, system. like I have here, uh, American Sign Language, a communication board, which we provide first responders. You know, if you're in need of some of these tools, make sure your son or daughter has them. But best, we also give pocket guides to give to first responders so that they can then walk away, and, and, or excuse me, that they can then give to the first responder, just giving them a couple of tips. I'm gonna show you the model that we utilize to, to train first responders. You can see how it comes in the context of what your personal needs are. And then responsiveness. You know, we talk about my son, my son's dysarthria, which is a speech disability, if you're not aware, uh, and um, his processing is delayed. Many people with, uh, across the development of disability spectrum, autism, intellectual disability, there will be a delayed response. It doesn't always go well with the first responder because they're looking for some immediate response. Uh, one program that uh, we've obtained says people with autism may pause seven to 14 seconds in responding.
That was seven seconds. You wonder what I, where I was, what I was doing? A little confused? Now picture that in an emergency response scenario. I got a process. When we receive language, the intent is to we first process it to the point of understanding it, and then we respond to that. I'm on a college campus. When a student doesn't understand what the professor is saying, he or she is raising the hand, asking the question why, so that they can understand it, because coming up is going to be a test or a narrative or uh, something that they have to uh, hand in to get graded on. So I better understand what I'm what I'm doing. That's not going to be the case in all of those uh, scenarios we're playing out on. We want to be able to self-preserve. Do I have the cognitive ability to self-preserve? And we're going to we're going to assess that. Kerry's going to put in the chat box the Mid America Regional Council. Uh, this is a tool that is for emergency planning. It's called your personal preparedness inventory. And the beauty of this is that I have found no better tool in the country than this. These are from my colleagues in the Kansas City area. Um, but it is something that you can utilize for both disaster and emergency planning, but also for that response of, of um, uh, one off of a first responder coming to a house. So, do I have the kind of ability to actually self preserve? which means I understand my plan. I'm able to um, execute that plan. My network of supports are utilized appropriately. Those, they're identified, they're active. I know when to use them. Physical limitations that may challenge that. My son knows he needs to egress when the alarm goes off, but if he's in bed tonight out of his power wheelchair, he can't. Uh, sensory disabilities that are not accommodated in alarms are provided the proper supports. Uh, faulty alarm systems that, I shouldn't say faulty because faulty means it's not functioning right. Alarm systems that are not accommodating to uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing or people with low vision who are blind. Ignore and actually put themselves in harm's way. So individuals who might not egress. When I ran the day program here in Niagara County for Niagara County ARC, every drill I had, two or three people would egress. When I had the fire chief come through with me, he was questioning what's going on here, but I was able to explain that. We worked together on that. It's gonna lead into one of my points in a minute here. To let you know, I'm on the National Fire Protection Association's Disability Accessibility Review and Advisory Committee. And we also have a tool um, that, Carrie, let's put that in the chat box too. The why I'm hesitant, this is the tool that we are phasing out. The new tool, however, might not be ready for another year, even though we phase this out. This is, the, this is your typical um, association legalese and all the hoops that need to be vetted for this tool to go out to the world, which I understand, uh, just a long time. So the old tool here, I will tell you right now, you're gonna see some archaic language, for instance, they say hearing impaired in there. Um, you know, we, those are all the things we've cleaned up with our revised edition. I just got on this about a year and a half ago and we, I jumped right into the uh, revising of the tool you're about to receive here. This still has a lot of functional purposes, um, but within it, you're gonna see what you're seeing on the screen here. The ability of notification. So what is an emergency? Do I understand what that is when I get notified? Do I know my way out or what we call wayfinding? I always say to people, when you go to a restaurant, when you go to a, an entertainment venue, any building, look for the second uh, way out. We'd see, oh, I walked in, I'll go out this way. Maybe you can't. Is there a second way out for me? Use of the way, do I do it myself? Do I need a device, say a walker, a, a, a walking cane, a, a power wheelchair? Do I need assistance? Say someone who's blind and needs an escort. Uh, someone who might have a, a, a might, who's using a manual chair needs to be pushed. So what kind of assistance do I need? So this is how we analyze um, the evacuation process. Okay, and again, I hope those tools you'll find helpful. Um, and please utilize them. They're, they're as good as it gets out there from, from all of our research. Hopefully if there's more and you got one, send it on to us. That's how we usually discover someone sending us something that they think is really good. Personally, what do you want your son or daughter, person with a disability to do? All should have proper identification. Uh, we ideally want them to wait for the request, especially with police officers. Someone sticking their hand in a pocket real quick is not uh, well received by police officers. Um, but we also, you'll see our model, what we teach them. So we're hoping that there's an understanding. Of course, many officers are not trained in it. So I want to be careful in uh, making it sound like they're trained. It's all going to be good. So having a proper identification, um, identifying your disability, explain any needs or personal characteristics about yourself. 
Now, here's the, here's the catch with this. Uh, I say every to every audience I train, you've heard of autism, Tourette syndrome, cerebral palsy, that, that, that. Clear your mind because your information is maybe inaccurate, is definitely not complete, and it probably is littered with misperceptions and myths. So, for instance, Tourette syndrome, people think of what? Swearing, which is actually called coprolalia. What about the 62 other ticks? which then are often mistaken, people with Tourette syndrome, with some form of psychiatric disorder, some form of psychotic state, some form of crises. It's simply ticks. Uh, and we go across the disability spectrum with that. Every disability is what I call the default responses. A mental health disorder or crises when it's not. Inebriation, say someone with cerebral palsy in their ambulation, spina bifida, other physical disabilities, and it's not. Or some form of illicit drug use dementia, autism characteristics, and it's not. But what's happening in the moment with a first responder? They see that untrained and I'm responding to one of the three, which you know is gonna be a different response than if they understood this is Tourette syndrome or this is Down syndrome or this is intellectual disability, so on and so forth. So we might need to explain our disability even though we tell them what it is we're gonna explain it. On our website, we have for people with developmental disabilities how to practice calling 911, which is not calling 911, we have a video on how to uh, use a fire extinguisher. So those are, those are tools that we have on our website and we'll show you the website at the end here. Um, practice community safety routines, when to talk to strangers, avoiding, uns avoiding unsafe locations. If the individual uh, uses transportation independently, uh, bus routes or such, um, have we practiced some of, these, some of these with them? Locking doors if they live independently, especially some of our young adults who move on to independent living. With, the, with intellectual disabilities, which many do. Uh, asking for directions, not opening the door when I should, when someone's knocking there, because there is the unfortunately uh, recognition with some perpetrators and Carrie and I have a lot of stories on this uh, that we won't get into today, uh, specific to people with development disabilities and the victimization uh, based on identification of the perpetrator recognizing uh, intellectual disability, whether they know exactly what it is or not, they recognize vulnerability from that disability. Know when to seek medical assistance. You know, uh, we're, we're not going to, you know, cut our finger that needs a band-aid and call 911. Uh, but that also goes with proper calling and responding. Um, we don't want to overcall. Have a network of supports and positive personal relationships. And this is a big part of both the uh, first responder training and especially the emergency management training. And the MARC guide in there, the personal preparedness inventory, one of the sections is a support network. But we also need to practice with our support network. We can't just say we got a support network, but we haven't talked to them in four years. Who can help me in those moments of need? In our town, we have child with autism signs. Now, it's not everyone who has autism, and we're certainly not going to put it up for everyone who has. There's actually some guidelines to this, but you could imagine elopers uh, and the intent to have that up because I'm seeing someone walk down the street right now and they're uh, in shorts and a t-shirt, no shoes, and they're walking the street as opposed to the sidewalk. And they're not responding to me, to, uh, me when I'm talking to them to say, hey, can I help you? So some indicators, what can we do? And outreach goes both ways. You know, first responders must connect with people with disabilities so, so they can completely understand the way that they support the disability community. You know, when we train and we talk about those community resources, identify the residences in your township. Uh, you yourself, are you identifying them through um, what we call the, is called the computer assisted device? Don't think for a minute that your police off, your police department, your fire department won't take your call if you, hey, I might have some concerns with my son or daughter and they're uh, eloping or during a fire and their ability to, to get out. Like my son, we have filled out a form in our town. I went to fire control. My, son, my house comes up in red. If there's a call right now to my house specific to fire. They know where my son's room is and they know they're going to a house with a person who uses a wheelchair. Um, so we want to make those connections. Uh, but the first responders also need to do that outreach. It's a two-way street. As I said, you need to connect as well with yours. And this must be done in advance of the need for assistance. Now what happens, so everyone has full disclosure here, the what's they call the computer assisted device or the CAD in the 911 system. For any calls that they become what what they call in the in the first response world frequent flyers, 
um, you get tagged. So if there's a, say a person with, with the early onset Alzheimer's and starts to call a lot, they start to identify. Uh, I just met with the local police department that I do some work with, and there's a, a gentleman who elopes and they're aware that the house is uh, uh, pretty much fortified, which they actually, the, the captain had some concerns with, we talked about, uh, but they all know who he is and it's in the system. So when a call comes in from that house, they know exactly where they're going, but we still wanna do that in advance. Our first responders outreach, and this is what we teach them. And this is what we want, we encourage you to do. We have the largest program for people with autism and behavioral disorders, uh, literally a quarter mile from the police department and about three miles from my house in Amherst, in Western New York. They have firefighters come in who dress into, who build themselves into gear. They dress into their fire gear. I like to call it, they morph into a firefighter. Um, so people see that and not see this strange, thing coming at them in what we know is fire gear and a helmet. Uh, but also we talk about uh, police officers going in and, and explaining. Uh, EMS coming in and talking about what's in the medical bag. Uh, registries is a whole other conversation, but if you do have one, is it built into fire control? Open houses that encourage the disability community to attend. So we talk to first responders, have an open house. Does it, does it have the accessible symbol on there? Or the symbol like, for instance, that we have down in the logo in the corner here. Are they, are they at fairs and festivals? What about your town's ADA coordinator? If you do have one, by law, you should if you have 50 or more employees, they serve a role. And we want them to establish a relationship with service providers to, to ensure that that's properly happening. We don't want things like this to happen. We're in Miami, the young man with autism in the gray shirt here um, came in the call that he had a, a gun in his hand. He had a toy train. Uh, staff went out to work with him. That staff laying on his back, you can tell he was responding to a police directive to get down with your arms up. This gets worse, folks. They fired. And the bullet struck the staff person in the leg. Now Florida has a mandatory autism training law for, for first responders. Let's not get to the point where we have to have that law because someone's shooting a gun uh, where they shouldn't be shooting a gun. Let the, let the staff person run the show here. That's what he was doing anyway. He was telling them it was a toy train. This young man in, in, in Missouri saw that on TV. That made national news. He got terrified by his communication board on his lap. He told his dad, I'm afraid of police. To which point they called the, the chief. She not only took the call, she got in the car with one of her officers and went to the house. And then this young man took the officer in the house and showed him how he communicate. We need to do that right now. Let's have those, let's have those conversations up front. Our model is this. We developed this with FDNY. They also received all of our training, uh, have received all of our training. Uh, recognize the indicators, the characteristics, or in simple terms, is something different, unusual, peculiar to you, which allows that first responder through our training, of course, to identify the disability. I believe this is Tourette syndrome or autism or dementia or traumatic brain injury, or this is a seizure. So then they have a proper approach, which is optimum. Understanding proper interaction, which includes etiquette skill, etiquette and, uh, and, and proper interaction skills, and which leads to an appropriate response, which has a lot to it, because that's ultimately the end result. We're responding in the moment, but that response might be an hour from now. That response might continue into, into tomorrow morning. But I said to the captain about the guy in his town the other day uh, who has autism and elopes, have you canvassed the neighborhood with mom and dad? Uh, what have you done with the police officers as far as training? Do you, only reckon, do you only encounter this gentleman when you are uh, uh, responding to him eloping? Again, we get much in deeper into that in our training, folks, you understand it, I'm sure. So how do you advocate? What do we, what do we ask you to do? Well, meet with your elected officials and your first responders, your chiefs, captains, whoever they've assigned to you. <clears throat> we expect the role with them, but be firm and direct about training and understanding what we're doing here today. The needs of them to be educated on this topic which starts with our training. And again, in our state for law enforcement, it's free. DCGS continues to fund us to train. We're training officers right now in this state in the last five days virtually. So we have about 20 departments that are in there being trained. Now we need them to go out and train if they indeed are, have a trainer. Uh, but receive emails from disability organizations to keep abreast of their actions and, and activities. Be disability eclectic, understand disabilities across the spectrum. Uh, don't settle when someone is giving you, well, we're only going to do half the training. Now, every moment's a teachable moment. So when we're having those encounters, let's, let's use those as teachable moments. 
So again, contact your first department, your first responder departments, ask them if they've gone through the training, explain the program if you if they haven't heard of it. Carrie, if you can put the briefs in the in the in the chat box if you do have them handy. If not, we'll send them out to folks. Meet with them, introduce yourself, your organization, your program you're involved with. I'm on the special education PTSA. Actually, I was actually actually act actively involved in ours for years. Uh, we'd like you to know more about the disability and response. Can you do more with the school district? Be a resource person of those first responder departments in your agency. Hey, we can help you if you have questions on this disability or want to know, need some answers to specific to getting, being directed somewhere. Point them to the tools and materials on our website. Spend some time on our website, folks. Spend about 10, 15 minutes. We have a lot of information you can access right now. We have emergency response information. Uh, we have emergency training uh, tools on there. We have videos that if they're on there, feel free to access. Begin the dialogue but please spend some time and point them that way. Specific to emergency planning and preparedness, the intent is to define access and functional needs and disabilities. The key terms related to inclusive planning, so the intent here is that we're all involved in the planning process. Identify appropriate resources to assist in planning for and with people with, and children and adults with disabilities and access and functional needs. Why it's important to have inclusive plan practices, Sue and I are, are constantly harping on the fact that we need to be sitting at the table. You are sitting at the table in your county. You have a very good response. What we call a core advisory group. Um, I'm just gonna keep moving here. Richard DeVelder, unfortunately we lost Richard a few years ago. Uh, God rest his soul. If you can recognize the picture here, he has no arms and legs. Richard tells us, yes, people with disabilities, plan as if nobody's coming. He's not being sarcastic. What he's saying to us is that there's a lot going on in the emergency planning and response world. That planning and response challenges are something that we can't sit back as a, as a community and say, well, they're going to take care of us when, we, when, when the floodwaters are coming down the street. I fill out a form with the, I fill out a registry or a form that they have so they know where I am. What are you doing? Why, how are you personally preparing right now? Not tomorrow, yesterday. There's a lot of tools out there. Sue has access to those tools. We have access to those tools. They're free. FEMA has an extensive amount of information. Uh, if you go to the FEMA site for um, last September, they did a, a full campaign. Uh, so FEMA.gov, I actually think it's called September. If you can't find it, let us know. So it's inherited upon us. Your emergency management departments are one or two people. And if it's, if it's a larger municipality, they have more staff, but they have more things to tend to. So how do we self-preserve? And actually, some of this I actually talked about already, so let's get move on. In emergency management planning and collaboration, we do see a coming together of the emergency management and the fire departments. But are they doing this? Do they know the sites and the houses that serve people with disabilities? Uh, in my town of Amherst, we're one of the largest towns in the state of New York. We have 10 fire departments, all volunteer in our town, just in our town. And I was working very closely with one of the former chiefs uh, whose daughter graduated with my son, and we still work together on things. He, um, when he, we, I have all the residents of, as of about six, seven, eight years ago, development service provider residences, in essence, of group homes, a listing of those. John, when he received the list, found out he had 10 residences in his jurisdiction. He thought he had three. He went for about two years saying, I can't believe I didn't know that. He was actually a little perturbed, uh, but that's why we do what we do. We want to be sure that the fire department and the emergency manager have contacted service provider administrations, which includes your day program, includes your schools. My son, when he went to the high school, same one I went to, so you know it's a little dated. Uh, I walked through with, with the vice principal to ensure that his emergency plan was 100% accurate. I stood in the hallway where um, the cafeteria at one end, which at that year did not have an accessible ramp to get in and out. Not, it did the following year. It's what we call advocacy. I made sure it did at least. Uh, they said it was on the list. It was done after that year. And she said, well, if he's in the cafeteria and there's a fire uh, drill, he would come down this hallway and go out one of the front doors. I said, you have him coming back into a burning building. Yeah, but if it was a if it was a real uh, alarm, we would do something different. Aren't fire drills to to assimilate what we're supposed to do properly when the when the alarm goes off? These are the things that we need to work with. We, the things you're talking about with your school district now. 
Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. I have one more video I, I prefer to show you. What might an individual need? Durable medical equipment, medications, adaptive equipment, assistive technology, transportation, and other health and medical needs. Our list is not super long. It is not extensive to the point where we have, you know, I like to call the laundry list. What you'll find in emergency planning and preparedness is, is, is the basics. The guide again, the Mark uh, Personal Preparedness Inventory addresses all of these needs, folks. It allows you to identify what your needs are today and then prepare accordingly. Are you prepared to shelter in place? We used to say three days minimum up to seven. Then the pandemic hit. We had people not leave their house for two, three, four, five months. Uh, we know we had many people with, with developmental disabilities not leaving group homes for months. Okay, so that, that, that the fear that struck us with catching the COVID, and the, the appropriate fear, you know, not, not these uh, people who, who downplay the, COVID, the, the pandemic as if it was just the flu. We had a million people die, folks. 200,000 of those were, were infirm elderly in congregate care. And again, the highest, the highest uh, ratio of any demographic, people with disabilities. Our state through New York City lost a lawsuit in response to this topic. This is a judge's comment um, post-awarding post the uh, lawsuit to disability rights advocates brought on by the um, Brooklyn Independent Living Center. Unfortunately, despite the obvious importance of accounting for the unique needs of people with disabilities in plenty of emergencies, New York City's emergency plans, like many state and local emergency plans throughout the nation, fail to do so. What was the judge saying here? I know most municipalities are not prepared properly for people with disabilities and emergencies, but I'm dealing with this lawsuit here. What are you doing to ensure that your municipality is responding to this? What are you doing personally? Oops, same page there. When we talk about communication access, people have access, people access communication differently. So some of the topics that we address here in the emergency planning and preparedness, response and recovery, are what you saw earlier, for instance, communication barriers. But now it comes to play here, specifically defined under the ADA in Title II, General Effective Communication. So what is different here? Well, how I see, I need something in large print. I need something in Braille. Hearing, I need an American Sign Language interpreter. I need captioning. Speaking, I have a speech disability, or I need you to slow down. I need you to lose, use plain English or basic language. Uh, moving. If I am in front of someone, I might need to not move. I might need to maintain my stance and look at them directly, especially if say they're speech or lip reading. Uh, my ability to read, learning disabilities, the millions of people that can't read, not because they're not intelligent, not because for any other reason, but they have a learning disability. Tom Cruise doesn't read his own scripts. Richard Branson and Charles Schwab struggle reading. Richard Branson, in the video I showed teachers, says I used to sit in the back of the classroom with my head down and hope I didn't get called on. Swab donates billions through his foundation to learning disability to schools uh, for learning disability. My ability to learn, which ties into communication. I, I am learning, which means I'm going to then communicate something. I need to understand it for remembering seniors with or without disabilities. The loss of memory is a natural part of aging. It's not just be, people tend to say, oh, I got a little dementia. Please don't ever make those comments. I have a little dyslexia. Th those are those are derogatory, even if they sound like they're cute. Um, and my ability to understand, again, plain English, basic language. Just some things to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, personally emergency preparedness. And this is, we tie this into shelters here, um, but it's accessibility. Okay, so it would be the disaster recovery center if we're going to a joint field office. Sheltering would be our biggest concern, physical access, General population versus medical shelter. No such thing as a special needs shelter. The term special needs is taboo in emergency planning. Quite frankly, we're trying to get rid of the term overall. Um, medical shelter is different. I might have medical needs, but oftentimes people with disabilities are confused just because they use a wheelchair that they need they have medical needs. My son doesn't have medical needs. He has seizures. He takes his Keppra. That's all we would need to have. And he'd be fine with me and my wife with them. Uh, general population should serve everyone, minus those who need a medical shelter, which includes people with disabilities. What support services are, are a, a part of my life? 
Again, communication access, programmatic access. Can I get around the program, the dining area, the quiet area, the restrooms? And then the recovery process. Power issues are a big challenge with, with uh, this topic. I told you I'm in Louisiana. One of the biggest things they asked me to uh, contribute to, which there's not a lot to contribute to here, folks. Do you have a generator? Do you have a backup to a generator? Do you have your, when you're, um, uh, your, I, your destination for uh, egress, if you're not going to a shelter, say a hotel or a family member's house, do they have, uh, is it accessible, first of all, but is there going to be backup power? Uh, again, power wheelchairs, medications that need to be refrigerated. So a big area of concern is, is power issues. And what are we doing in advance to plan on that? Which can cost, which includes where am I going? I, I hear from uh, people in Louisiana, how uh, the development service office that I work with, how uh, people um, identify hotels that they're going to go to. They go to a hotel that doesn't have a generator. During Hurricane Ida, I was on a sev uh, several of their calls with their emergency management disability and aging committee. And uh, sitting on the like day five of Hurricane Ida, so like the first weekend in September, and people were asking, can, I, can you send me a generator? No, we can't send you a generator. So our, our planning. And then personal assistance services. Who's going to be assisting the person you work with? Is it in that guide that we just gave you that's going to be identified how to groom and eat and toilet and transfer? And someone might help need help completing forms. So personal assistance services being sheltering in place, the absence of the ability for the, my personal assistance services to come to me if I'm sheltering in place. Uh, you've had challenges with floods in your area, obviously well documented. Uh, I might be sheltering at home, but the person that's supposed to come assist me might not, might not be there. So do we have all this identified and prepared to respond to it? And who might provide these services? Not just personal assistance, but also think of that support network. Because really, truly, your first, your, your first line of, of support network is your neighbor. My parents, when they're in town, they're, they're snowbirds, they're in Florida now, they live about two miles from my house. But I'm still not right next door to them. And when I'm up here in the office or traveling, I'm nowhere near them. It's the person next door to you. I want to, uh, this will pick, take us somewhat to a close here. This is a um, FEMA video. And here we go. Dappled sunlight through trees and a wisteria covered front porch. No two days are alike. An older woman sorts her medication. So every day you prepare. A woman who is blind feeds her service dog. For yourself, she places the bowl on the floor and he eats. For those you love. A mother using a wheelchair packs a lunchbox. Her daughter takes it, kisses her, and runs off. For whatever the day may bring. A man who is deaf signs to a loved one and departs. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies. The older woman assembles her kit. As well as any important documents you may need. She includes a USB drive. Being prepared is a part of who you are and disaster preparation is no different. The man who is deaf stores his kit in the closet. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. The mother using a wheelchair closes her kit and hugs her daughter. Words on screen. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Ready.gov slash my plan. And again, folks, there's extensive tools out there. So go, go to ready.gov. Uh, and my plan, but you can find uh, you can find this information. Uh, we put some of it in here. 
Um, there's family plan pocket guides. There's family plan forms. Uh, oh, Gary, we're going to also put the to-go kit in here as well. Another point to be made here, folks, did you catch the uh, communication access in there? We had captioning, we had a sign language interpreter, and we have what we call audio descriptions, which is what those little comments were when people were doing activities or there was a, or there was a scene. So just to close, evacuation and transportation, what do you have in line as a backup plan? Okay, if you don't drive, if someone you, if, um, you do drive, if you are uh, access uh, uh, accessible vehicles for transportation, what if they're not available? So you wanna be real keen to that. Here's my contact information. That's our, again, our website. That's my direct office line if you have any questions. Uh, let's see, let me put my email in the chat box and I am open for questions in our last couple of minutes here. 